Welcome to the Party Trick Podcast, where we inspire and empower you to elevate every day. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Party Trick Podcast. Hi, it's so good to be here. I'm so excited. I am very excited too. I've been looking forward to this all week and I want to share a few different things with our audience. Of course, your beautiful Goldie Home products. We will get to those in a little bit, but I think it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't talk a little bit about your career and your experience and what led you to this point. So again, you're the founder and president of this amazing homeware line, but that wasn't always the case. You left right. uh, yeah. a bustling career at L and Marie Claire. Tell me about, like, tell me about your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. There definitely was a big career before Goldie Home. I'll make it quick, but I graduated college. I had to get a job and I kind of fell into fashion and advertising and marketing just by luck. I, I didn't mm. really know what I was falling into. And my first job out of college was at LVMH. And that was pretty much the year that they went from like six companies to 25 companies. And I, I was 21. I had no idea what I was at in the middle of, and it was an amazing experience because I got to really understand the power of a brand and the way brands are built from small startups to large established brands with so much equity. And I also, at that time, was really at the center of advertising, creative, all the things that go into building a brand. And I learned so much there. I quickly then went to a small boutique branding agency where I got to work on incredible brands, kind of branding them like Burberry, and David and a lot of other brands in the luxury lifestyle space, not just fashion and jewelry, but resort really across the gamut. And at a young age, I got an incredible exposure to um, a lot of people um, in publishing and a lot of people in the creative space and really kind of was at the, the fourth or really at the intersection of creative and marketing mm -hmm. and creative and business. And um, that was a long time ago when magazines were really big. And that's, we, we shot creative campaigns that had like 12 spreads in Vogue and it was exciting. And I was kind of in my twenties at such an amazing time in fashion and advertising. And then that job took me to Armani exchange for a little bit. And I'm saying one of my clients was Elle magazine. And shortly after my freelance stint there, the publisher at the time brought me on full time. Mm. And I spent a little over 12 years at Elle really um, evolving with the times there. So integrated marketing was a thing that that's not really a thing anymore because everything is integrated. And my last stint at Al was really creating the creative services team on the publishing side. So pretty much brand and branded content. And when advertisers would come to us and say, we love the vibe of the brand, the L brand, how can we fuse our brands and make a campaign that makes sense? And so I would bring in the photographer, I'd bring in the stylist, and we kind of create these mini brands. And for our advertisers where it felt completely native when they were running in the magazine and online. So I spent a long time kind of building that creative services department there. And it was obviously a lot more to it, but um, in December, 2019, I decided to leave. Mm. I, it was a time I had had enough. There were changes going on there at Hearst. And at that point I was really working with Elle Marie Claire and Harper's Bazaar because we were starting to hub titles. Anyways, I decided to leave. I, I was I was ready for my next chapter. And I left and I was looking for my next position in the corporate fashion, advertising, whatever that world that meant. I was open and COVID hit. And yeah, and that's, uh, I yeah. slept there. It was a matter of time and I couldn't, the timing couldn't have been better for me to decide to leave and take a pause, reset. And yeah. And then you were home. So we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. In a and second. then I was home. Yeah. And then I was home. Well, I have to just mention this because it was on my mind when you were talking about how magazines used to be so huge and like just a part of everything yeah. in the spreads that you did. Like I was imagining because yeah. I grew up watching yeah. Lauren Conrad doing the internship at Teen Vogue and every girl wanted the internship at Teen Vogue. Yeah. She will always be known as the girl who yeah. didn't go to Paris, you know? <laughs> and, yes. And, yes. and to think yes. about how yes. that industry has all evolved and how you were in the industry. You know, when it went from print marketing to now, it's just everything. It's your phones, it's social media, it's on TV. It's like everything is everywhere all at once when it comes to advertising and getting creative with yeah. getting in front of those eyes. So it's really interesting. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's really interesting. And I, I, I don't think about it often, but I'm thinking about it now. I, I really consider myself super lucky that I got to experience creative at the time I did because it, 
know, it was so, we really spent so much time. It was such an art form, the mm-hmm. photography we would take and how we would think about the medium before we thought about the creative. You know, how is it going to look in a four page spread in L? And then we would shoot accordingly. And now it's so different. It's different. It's not a different in a bad way. It's just different. And, but I still take the things that I loved over my career. I am able to take them, crystallize them and bring them into my world now, which is so yeah. cool because I'm always conscious of, oh, this, this is how I need to do this because this is what I know that I know it works. So yeah, it's a completely different world. We used to just wait with bated breath to see like what the September Vogue was going to be. And it, it was just exciting. You get, you get swept up in your world. I mean, you really, at that time, we really lived and died for what we did. We felt passionate about it. And it was, it was exciting. You, know, you felt like you were making a mark. Um, yeah. Even in our little fashion world. Yeah. But, well, um, you did. I mean. Anyways, that was many, many years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I think there's something really admirable about coming to the realization yourself of like, okay, I'm done here. I'm going to create space in my life to see what's next. You didn't know that just a few short months later, we would be stuck at home and you live in New York City. So you were quarantined in your apartment for weeks and weeks. Tell me what that was like. So you quit your job, you're at home and you're looking for the corporate job. Then the pandemic hits. Like, what were you doing during this time to kind of recenter and ground yourself? Um, The pandemic hits and I don't even think it was a conscious decision to say, okay, I'm not looking for a job anymore because at those early weeks, work was, unless you're an essential worker, work was kind of in a somewhere mm. else in your line. And we were in our apartment with my two children who I guess were nine and 11 at that point or eight and 10. And yeah, eight and 10. And um, I just got super creative. <laughs> my creative instinct kicked in. And I said, we, I just felt like we had, I had to be producing something all the time to mm. not make myself feel like I'm going, we're going crazy. Because mm-hmm. time was sitting still at that point. We all remember you know, we were going outside with gloves on and no one was outside on the street. And I just immediately went to creativity and I hadn't exercised that muscle in so long, but it was like needed to come out. And I started dying, like so many of us, um, dying anything I get my hands on. So I had like plain t shirt had white linen and white cotton napkins and I bought really good dyes did a little research and in our little laundry room I just I couldn't stop dying and what happened very quickly is that people saw what I was doing and they're like oh I want one I want one and we were all wearing tie-dyed clothes at the time but mine kind of looked a little bit different because I was using a little higher Mm. end dye and I was like okay here's what I can do everything goes to no kid hungry here's a pdf and I, random people were coming to me within like a five block or emailing me in a five block radius saying, can you make it that's for me? Or can you make this for me? At that time I was doing home, like buying napkins from any place I can find them from that were white and cotton or linen that I knew I could dye and sweatshirts and t-shirts. And I felt amazing. Like those first two months of COVID, we were lucky. We were all healthy. We were all, my family's together. And I was just so productive. And I was just feeling so alive in a weird way, like in this weird time didn't exist. I'm just going to keep dying. My hands were like permanently dyed. And I was just, just giving everyone dyed clothing and <laughs> textiles. And what started happening was that I realized how good it was making me feel. One. Mm. And at the same time, in terms of my family, we, I know we all can relate to this dinner all of a sudden had this, took on this much bigger meaning than it ever mm. had before, because my husband and I have both worked full time. And so we never had dinner together consecutive nights as a family. It was always, okay, I'm standing at the island. You take this, you have this, I'll heat this up. I have a piece of cheese and that's it. And for the first time, we all sat down at the table and had dinner together. And that was magical. And day after day after day, we all looked forward to dinner. And I started setting the table with any lens and beautiful dishes and pottery I had. And I realized that my kids were just at that age that they were smart enough and mature enough to realize that when the table set, everyone stays longer. And every night the table was set and we had intention and we stayed, we laughed, we talked, and they were really, really special. Now, no matter how busy my kids are, or how busy we are, there's hardly a night that goes by that we don't have dinner together. Oh. It's the most special thing. And I th- thank you for COVID, for giving that to us, for ch- making us real. The two things started connecting was one, I was like, oh, this makes me feel amazing making product. 
and um, designing product and styling it and photographing it. And it also makes me feel amazing sitting at the table, enjoying it. Let me spread that to other people. And so make a long story short, I had always painted on the side and always wanted to take painting to put them on textiles. I didn't know how or what that looked like. And mm-hmm. so I realized, wait a second, let me experiment. And this is again, everything is shut down in New York. I started just researching what kind of samples I could get if I took watercolor paintings and had them printed on various kinds of fabrics. It was like, was navigating on the garment district when no one was there. Garment district to myself. And it was just a big learning curve, a learning process. And I created my first website. At that point, I called it Goldie Girl. And I started getting really good response. And and then pretty much in the fall of 22, I decided to, okay, you know what? I want to do home. I, I, this is, I think I can do this. This is the time now to do this. This is making me feel great. I think I have something. And pretty much fall of 22, I decided to think it's Goldie Home. It's going to be a combination of dyed prints and a combination of paintings. And they're going to be, I'm going to figure out the process. And um, I did, you know, it was one of those things when I didn't have anything figured out before I launched. I kind of said, you know what? I'm smart. I work for a really long period of time. I'm, ten- I'm tenacious. I'll figure this out. Yeah. And I'm still, I'm, I'm still figuring it out. I get why people have a business plan. I get why people figure out the production in advance. I kind of was doing it on the go a little bit. But I, I, my feeling was, let me see how customers react to it. Let me see how stores react to it. Let me use it as a litmus test. And then mm-hmm. let me grow based on that. And so that's what I've been doing. Those are the two real things that propagated me to go into this isn't it so wild how there are such specific elements of experiencing the pandemic that we did that like totally set up a new trajectory in our lives like I think that thing for you is is dinner with your family you now have teenagers I'm sure they're they're close to teenagers and they're sitting down for dinner with you every single night and yeah would that ever have happened you know we hadn't had that disrupt no, I, I can't say, you know, when you have disruptions, I think they remind you of things and they bring back things and it reminded me and it made me realize how much I love entertainment, you know, mm. and I love having people over and I always did. I, I love this idea of my door being open and anyone coming over at any time and being comfortable enough in my fridge to take something and yeah. me having a bottle of wine open, something in the fridge I can just put out like that really brings me joy. And, and I'm very relaxed in the kitchen, you know, and I'm very relaxed when I have friends over, I think because I'm so happy. Um, and I wanted to kind of share that with yeah. others because now that we're kind of in this post COVID space or in this whatever space we're in, but both can live at the same time, you know, going out and being at home mm. and they both have great benefits and great, but it's just so, it's so nice to have people over and to make it special, you know. Yeah, I'm actually curious. I mean, you did mention that you would like stand around the island, like eating the cheese. Like at our house, we call it yo-yo. You're on your own night. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's everybody's just fun for, fun for themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you talked about how you enjoyed putting together these tables and it turned into the linens. And I kind of want to transition into Goldie Home, but also want to stop you because you said you called it Goldie Girl first. So mm-hmm. where does Goldie, just where does Goldie come from? Yeah, I'm happy. That's, yeah, thank you for um, so Goldie was my grandmother's name oh, no. on my mother's side. And to me, she kind of reflected just pure happy, you know, like she was just joyous inside and out. And um, my daughter's middle name is Goldie and my mm. niece's middle name is Goldie. So it's kind of also this idea of kinship and connection. And we're all kind of united at the table. We're united mm. for something. We all are connected. And um, so that's Goldie. That's Goldie. Wow, that's so pretty. Yeah, special yeah. and cute. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's such a cute family name too. So, yeah. when I'm just curious, and I know you're talking about like a weeknight out eating around the countertop, but were you the type of person before who would like save your linens, would save your glassware for like the special occasion, like only whenever I'm having anybody over? Like, how has that changed? I mean, you've mentioned that you're using all the pottery and I I can just picture you in your apartment like you're doing a photo shoot like putting together oh like let me pull this candle out of the bathroom or oh this like toy from my son's room like goes with the color scheme like just totally creating something so specific and special 
But I, I think a lot of people can relate to like saving their stuff for special occasions. And what we do at Party, you know, this is elevate the everyday. So yeah, when I looked at your website and I saw, you know, at Goldie Home is designed for celebrating and intended for weeknight meals, fabulous dinner parties and everything in between. Yeah. How, how has that changed in your everyday life? Are you using Goldie linens at home on your table every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, so I was never the person who saved anything special. No, special okay, cases. okay. Like when we got when we got when we got married, we never got you know we got these amazing Missoni plates that Missoni dishes that I don't use every day, but I use I you know, um because I knew that I wanted I'm very much like the high level you know it's so over yeah but yeah. I I I like putting it if it's not gonna get I want everything out you know and I want to be able to use it based on what mood I'm in so didn't really save things for special occasions that much but um i do i because goldie is my brand i use goldie every we use goldie every night at the table i don't set the table on a glamorous way every night by any means but um like i do i do like to kind of make confuse the everyday with very special you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's just about like what what mood you're you know it's, yeah. it's kind of like the way you'd you know it's like what mood you're in how does that reflect on the you know, there just doesn't have to be just one way to set it, kind of make it your own. And it, you always don't have to cook either. Like you can order Chinese no. or pizza and use these beautiful napkins and set a beautiful table and it can be such a, a beautiful experience. Uh, yes. thousand percent. I mean, I, I, we, I put the Chinese food in the, I mean, I'm, I'm very visual of this. So I'll, I'll put the Chinese food in the dishes, but then maybe I'll leave the rice in the in a um, carton just because it has that effect to it um yeah for 100 percent, there's no need to cook every night you can definitely do take out just make the table feel a little special make it feel use don't um paper napkins definitely use cloth napkins they'll make you feel so much better they just they, they, they look yeah they just look so much better and they're so much better for the environment yeah um, i was just gonna yeah. say that's like my number one sustainability tip is using cloth yeah. napkins i mean i get them at estate sales i love finding yeah, different cloth cool. napkins because it's like think about every single meal that you eat if you're grabbing a paper towel up you know a paper napkin for every meal and we're all doing that everywhere that's just like so simple something that we can change 100 percent. i mean i also think um it changes the vibe of you know it changes the way you consume the food and all that so or drink or whatever yeah even even with cocktail napkins, you know i'm so into cloth cocktail napkins um which feels a little bit more special a little bit more now yeah it, it's elevating the everyday it's it's not yeah. winning yeah so anyway yeah uh, i i want to ask you though because you had such a such a creative process you said like i was so productive i was so productive more than ever but actually i feel like you were just in flow because you were creating and mm -hmm. like exploring and yeah. trying to figure out something new i'm so creative as well and I really enjoy hearing about the process of like ice dyeing and then buying these dyes and then like the the step by step that evolved into what we see now. Yeah. I want to know about the process of getting your art printed or like made onto a fabric onto napkins because it's not dyed yeah. anymore. It's it's mm -hmm. printed, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it was a serious and still is really big learning curve. I, I have to say the hardest part. And it probably will always be the hardest part of launching this business is production. And and I never touched production at all in mm. my um, so I came at it very much thinking, I'm gonna figure this out. And I have to and I also felt I had to understand it or else I couldn't delve it. You know, I couldn't hire someone to do it. I had to understand how it works so that I could be intimately involved with the process so that when I want to tweak things, I know if it's tweakable. And as I Scale and as I grow larger, I need to make sure that I understand what it is. And so there's been a lot of learning curves. Um, digital printing is right now everything is digitally printed in my collection. So because, but when I first started, to your point, I was hand dyeing the dyed prints and digitally printing the artwork. It's with digital printing, it's just you got to find the right printer. You have mm. to find the right fabric, fabric that can take the printing because the you're putting a coat over the fabric. And so it can either harden, it can stiffen, it could not be a good printer so that the, the colors don't look rich and saturated enough. Um, there's so many variables. And, and I was very specific about the kind of stitching I wanted on the sides also. And so when I started out, I was doing a lot of samples. I would try this printer that I would do a lot of research, like at that, oh God, not Condé, Vogue had a, a fund, a 
on campus, oh, CFDA, oh my God. CFDA had a lot of resources. So I would like call every single person on the resource to see if they could do it. I did a lot of, I made a lot of mistakes, but I did them in small amounts and nothing really cost me. It was, but I, I tried and I tried producing in, in Long Island and then tried producing between Nate and South Carolina. <laughs> and, and then I realized I needed a producer that could be vertical for me. That could be all in one. That could help me with the fabric, could treat the fabric, could print the fabric, so, um, sewing for the fabric and could do the post treatment. So I, I needed one. I couldn't be sending this to this and this, because yeah. it just wasn't working and I needed it to be cost effective. And so it took me a lot of different phone calls, a lot of networking, a lot of questions asked, a lot of emails unreturned, um, took me to Portland mm. and I was there last summer meeting with the manufacturer um, and that opened up a whole new world for me as well. And I also really felt that right before a pandemic hit, I got to go to Mexico City with my husband for a couple of days and I fell in love with Mexico City. Um, and like all over Europe and Mexico City, the vibe is always, everyone's outside eating and it just like effortlessly so full. You know, everyone's just there and you feel like the hours just go by and everybody is just totally enjoying themselves. And that was kind of the inspiration for Goldie, which was just this effortless feeling. Like you're just so happy at the table. You don't want to leave and like comes out. And so producing in Portugal made me feel good because it kind of felt like it has a European sensibility to it. Mm -hmm. um, the brand and the brand ethos. And so I connected there. Anyways, I'm producing in Portugal and that's going well. And I have a couple other manufacturers I'm talking to in that same area. I'm going, um, and, right, when my kids go to camp in June um, to do more research and to meet with more and to do more sound. It, it was a big process and it still is. I'm learning a lot all the time about how it works because it's not so simple. It's not just, it, at first I thought, oh, it's just getting a cut. And then it's just getting a cut and like doing you know, that bounce. And then it's just, it's, you know, it's all, it's all so specific and nuanced. It, and you really care about it. So it's, it's good that you're so passionate about it because yep. you can do the things that maybe like you don't always love doing. It's clear that you're like this creative visionary and then doing the stuff on the back end where it's like the not so beautiful parts of running a business. Yes. You're like, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> Yes, there's so many not so beautiful parts of it, as we all know. <laughs> Anyone who's starting a business, um, as you know, um, yeah, but that's that's it, and that's production. Um, but it's 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 interesting. It's been interesting. Yeah. Cool. No, I mean, yeah. Yes. I think it's 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 a humbling one to like have your own business, but two, it's also just super admirable to see someone who has the career that you've had, and and also look at you, who's like, I don't know everything. I'm still figuring everything out and I don't pretend to know everything, but I'm doing this and I'm doing my best and I'm going to show up every single day. Yeah. Like that's really all you can do. And that, I, mean, I really do believe. And the other thing I would add to that is like, you have to believe in yourself so much. Mm, um, yes. You kind of have to constantly tell yourself that you have this, you've got this, you can do this. You, you are determined. And yeah, yeah I mean, you can do this and it'll work. And I also think that, you know, there's not, I'm not designing linens that are neutral colors that are, that are, well, you know, mine make a statement. Mm -hmm. And that's just the decision I decided that was, that's, that's my vision for the brand. And that's not for everyone. So it's also about finding the right market, you know, yeah. about finding the right customers and the right stores and the right markets and the right, uh, you know, because there is a, there is a fit for everyone. You just have to find it. So I, Speaking of like the the visual piece of it all, I'm I'm picturing your tables. I want to know like your must haves for what you put on a table. Yeah. One, if like you have barely nothing. Two, if you don't want to spend very much money. But yeah. the the thing that I want to start with is, do you imagine your products being mixed and matched? Do you like when it's the tablecloth that's the you know the napkins, or what what does that look like in your mind when people are executing this in their own homes? Yeah, I love mixing and matching. I, I've designed the collection kind of the colors on the borders are specifically designed so they can and should be mixed. Um, okay. I, you know, and I think it, it, they all go with one another. And as I'm working on this next collection, I'm also super conscious of that because everybody, some people like, like if it's a Tuesday night or, or maybe someone's a little bit, likes a little bit of a plainer table, they can use just the napkin and they can mix their other solids and pans. Um, if they want something that's kind of a little bit more, just a little bit more of a, not over the top, but a little bit more maximalist vibe, they can, you know, the tablecloth, even layer the place napkin, you know, the, yeah. the, that three layers and the different uh, color and that texture and that 
Um, so definitely meant to make um, definitely meant to make it your own. And I, um, I think that you know I don't I don't think a table needs to cost. Um, I as you're saying I buy vintage. There's an amazing flea market right by us that I go to every Sunday. Um, there's great vintage homewares there. Like I love colored glass. I love lots of glass, like lots of different dishes. I love mixing and matching my dishes and my plates. So um, I love different colors, silver, even, you know, like black matte silverware or gold, shiny silverware, or, you know, like just doing something a little different um, and nothing, none of it needs to be, and, um, it can all be just a mixed match. And that's what you guys are doing. So you're showing the cost, you're showing party trip members how to shop the table, you know, how to like mix and match high, low. Nothing is good, you know, you can do yeah. it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I yeah. think when I think about party trick parties, it's like three or four different options for a tablecloth or something like that. Because then, oh, like, and on it, this is a truth from my own life where I was getting inspiration for a table that I was doing at my house recently. And I don't have a linen, I wanted a linen beige, like neutral tablecloth. I was, that was like the vibe that I was going for. I'm like, yeah. I didn't have one. I didn't have time to order one, whatever. I pulled my, I have like a Brooklyn and linen sheet, sheet. flat yeah. sheet, the king sheet. And I put it on my bat on my table. It looked amazing. So it's like just getting creative. I'm sure of that. Also the <laughs> texture. Yeah. 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 For sure. That, that's uh, a brilliant idea. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's all about using what you have. Like, are you, are you a candles person? Like, do you have to have candles? Do you have like tea lights going on the table? Like, especially if you're throwing something together and like, I'm picturing like girls just called, Hey, we're come over for dinner. They're coming over in 20 minutes. Like, yeah. what are you just like quickly throwing together on the table? Is it, of course your linens. Well, yeah. I recently, of course my linen. I recently got these, I don't know where you know where I found them, these great little um, stubby candlestick holders and they're like different colored glass and they have like a pop color rim to them. And so I love putting a lot of those out on the table and just like tapers on there mm. like, tea, tea, and mixing in tea lights. As okay. I'm excited about this question because you worked yeah. in fashion media for a really long time. So I can imagine that you've gone to some really cool parties. I want to know about maybe the greatest party you've ever been to, but something that like really sticks yeah. out in your mind. Maybe it was a detail or, you know, just something that made you feel really special. The music, some parties from your time in fashion media. Oh my God. That's such a good question. I don't, I have to go way back in my mind. I mean, so many cool ones, but I was so young and I probably didn't. It was interview. There was a party on Studio 54. Oh, right. Studio 54. That it was for interview at magazines. I, I don't know what anniversary it was. Was it their 75th anniversary? I don't, I don't know, but it was just off the hook. It was crazy. It was like in people performing amazing music and amazing acts on the, in the stage, the funkiest, most amazingly dressed people in New York and like the coolest artsy one. It was just so over the top. It was so, so cool. Um, yeah. And, and those gift bags also at the end of the night, that was Ooh. when budgets were like incredible. <laughs> so inflated. That's a, but the, the, the gift bags. Well, um, so I would say interview magazines. I want to say it was like their 75th or their 80th anniversary party at Studio. Um, um I actually met my husband at a, a fashion week party mm -hmm. at Lever House for another magazine. Yeah. So that was pretty great also. That was the height of the height of when fashion week was like a serious, you would actually go to shows and go um, versus everything being virtual or, or different now. But um, yeah, there definitely were a lot of cool parties and a lot of spirits. So uh, they're probably somewhere in my mind all wrapped up together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll have to, yeah, I'll, I, uh, I'm, I'm imagining myself coming to New York and going to the market with you, getting, um, some good yes, home finds. I would love that. That would be amazing. And we'll have, and then we'll yeah, come over and we'll make you a really good cocktail and Ooh. you like tequila. Mm -hmm. so, um, my favorite is, uh, it's like a Negroni, but with tequila. Okay. Tell me how you make it. Um, that was another question that I had. Like, what it, is, how do you make yeah, it? It's just a Negroni, but instead I put tequila in there with an orange rind and, um, it's delicious it's so um, i think it's called a rosita mm. it is if you look it up if you look up negroni with tequila it's rosita but um it's delicious it's so good and yeah and you'll come over and we'll go to the market on a sunday so come over on a sunday because that's okay nice. okay um, fresh fresh food fresh produce and um great flea market what's the market for anyone listening in new york that they it's can 70, it's the 79th street farmer's market so it's on 79th and columbus perfect um every sunday 
it ends at like three or four, but it's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, the last question was, what's your go-to party trick? And I'm wondering if it's like having a cocktail ready in hand for people when they walk in the door, cocktails are ready, already made, fresh and cold, but it could be something else. What is your go-to party? I, um, you know, when friends come in, you have drink, drinks ready to go is out, you know, try to delay. I love delaying the sit down meal for as long as I can. So the pre part, the pre-game or the pre-party or the cocktails period last for as long as possible. But what I do also love is just at that, you know, dinner's finished, the plates aren't yet taken, every it's the table looks a little messy or and undone and there's definitely wine, you know, a little and dripped a little bit in places. Uh, um I love kind of handing the phone around for people to DJ. Um just because it's like everybody's super relaxed. Everybody's had a couple of drinks you know, you're ready for the music, you're playing louder again, and it kind of takes until like phase two of the night. So I kind of love when, you know, you've had a good dinner party or a good party when people are still ready to start like taking the music in control of their own and playing their, playing a song and then getting it to the next person playing their own song. And that's just kind of fun. So that is fun. That that's kind of my party trick. Yeah. That's a good party trick. I never would have thought of that. I was going to ask you what you have playing. What's your playlist vibe during the cocktail hour once arriving, you know, extending the time till you sit down? Yeah. What's the vibe? Well, I, I, so if it depends on who's DJing, if it's my husband, he's probably playing um, or some really good instrumental something. But if it's me, I love the band, everything. Um, And it's kind of sexy. It's, it just reminds me of college. Um, And so I usually have that playing when people come on in or more chiba. Everything but the girl. Haven't heard, but I'm going to check them out right after. It's this. so good. You're going to love. You're going to love. Okay. It's so good. I'm I'm a big playlist like music person setting the soundtrack, and I'm definitely going to look into this. Oh yes, yes. I actually need a good dinner next, so you'll have to hit me up. What you I'll say. send you some. I have some I from my own personal. Some. Yeah, I will. I will. And we also have that. a Spotify for party trick that is getting off the ground so we're building everything but i actually was just working on a playlist before we jumped on today for a austin inspired bachelorette party so we we've got it all oh but great. we're building it I in real time that. too well music's super key and it's definitely personal so um you kind of put your own stamp exactly to make it your exactly own. yeah yeah well, Sarah, this has been incredible. I have really enjoyed getting to know you and sharing your story with our community. And I also wanted to mention, guys, you can purchase Goldie Home products all over New York City and many boutiques. I've seen like Illinois, like all over the country. There's so many boutiques that have the products in store. But also, if you are a host with Party Trick, you get access to 15% off any online order of Goldie Home. So if you want to check out some linens, you want to pick up some napkins, we have these rose painted uh, napkins for Mother's Day, that would be perfect. Head to Party Trick, sign up to be a host, and get that 15% off. 